this privileged rich lady makes ready for it six grand an hour to lecture white people at corporate hr departments she's the worst example of projecting race of a projecting race hustler I think we can all agree that we've had somewhat of an eventful 2020. One thing that seemingly has happened is there seems to be a lot of talk about white fragility. A woman by the name of Robin D'Angelo put out a book, I believe two years ago. However, the book has uh, gotten somewhat of a resurgence. It's, it's shot up, I, I believe, to like number one on Amazon and it's becoming increasingly mainstream. She was invited to go on Kimmel, which Kimmel, one of the Jimmies, it was either Kimmel or Fallon. It's about as mainstream as you can get, I suppose. So I, oppressed black male, went out of my own way and purchased a copy of White Fragility, and I thought that we could perhaps go through it together and see what uh, some of the ideas it espouses. In theory, I could have just got this thing as a PDF, but I thought, why not just increase the disparity between the races and I, as a black male, give towards a white female? Look at this bad boy. White fragility. Why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism? Well, as you can see, I'm nice and melanated up, and so, um, Given the, the subtitle of this book, it shouldn't be difficult for me to go through this. Let's have a look at the... Uh, the challenges of talking to white people about racism. I'm vaguely curious because I'm like, how would she even know? She's a white person herself. I'm just kind of curious. Is this Rachel Dolezal? Well, I peel the face off of this book here and it's actually Rachel Dolezal this whole time. The value in white fragility lies in its methodical, irrefutable exposure of racism in thought and action and its call for humility and vigilance. That sounds fairly decent so far. A vital, necessary, and beautiful book. I'll be the judge of that. Anti-blackness, racial triggers for white people, the result, white fragility, white fragility in action, white fragility in the rules of engagement, white women's tears, oh, my favourite kind of tear. And um, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here in white women's tears? That's bars, bro. I thought, seeing as I don't really know this whammon, before I get into it, I would, we could perhaps watch the Jimmy or Fallon clip together and let's get a rundown of what she's talking about, bro skis. And then we'll start reading White Fragility. I don't really know how important it will be for people watching this video, but I presume because it pertains to identity that my identity markers might be thought to be important. So I guess I should give those out as clarifiers. Black, evidently. I grew up in a very lower class household. I have five siblings. My parents, as far as I'm aware, have only ever lived in council housing, which if you're from the States, I think would be, it's, it's government housing. So basically, I suppose what this clarifier is coming from is that through the uh, identitarian lens, not coming from a place of privilege. Dr. Robin D'Angelo, thank you so much for doing The Tonight Show. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are and everyone wants to talk to you right now. So this means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone wants to talk to her right now. I wonder what social interactions may have sparked that. White fragility, uh, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. This was, this came out in 2018. Yes. And it's been uh, on the bestseller list ever since then. It has, yes. And right now it is number one on all the lists I looked at. And it's also, what I, from what I read, it's sold out everywhere as well. Right, which is exactly why we're investigating this, because seemingly everybody is uh, slurping on this. Um, so, you know, it's important, I suppose, to see what's going on. <gasps> in the zeitgeist. How often have you attempted to give a white person feedback on their inevitable and often unaware racist assumptions or behaviors and have that go well for you? Inevitable? Oh, uh, she's one of these. All white people are racist looking ass. Okay. 
I think white people should remove that phrase from their vocabulary. I'm not racist. It's not, I, trust me, it's not convincing to black people. So all white people are imperatively racist. Got it, including her, especially her perhaps. Also, how would she know what black people, I'm just like, is this Rachel Dole is all in disguise? Does she know the black experience? What is the black experience? Is that a canon? As long as we define racism as individual intentional acts of meanness, then I would agree with you that most white people are not racist. But when I'm talking about the racism that I have, the racism that you have, it's, it's the result of living in a society in which racism is the foundation. So McCarthyism, everyone is guilty until proven innocent, and there's no such thing as an innocence because everybody is racist imperatively, or all white people are racist imperatively, and even if they were to say such a thing as, I'm not racist, you can't say that because according to her they should just remove it from their vocabulary. Gotcha! This is going to be really distressing, I'm sure, for my white mom and white girlfriend who at any turn, seemingly, um, through what we're learning here, I can just accuse them of racism. And then when they get angry, I can be like, wow, your whiteness is really fragile. And I'm going to have no critical thinking on this topic, no skills to navigate this uncomfortable conversation, and no emotional capacity to withstand how uncomfortable the conversation is. And that means Black people can't be their authentic selves with us. What the f*** are you talking about? The amount of, I suppose, like, self-assuredness and, like, self-righteousness and self-importance to be like, oh, without white people, black people can't authentically be themselves. It's so kind of, like, paternalistic. And if you start there, how has being white shaped my life? And how is that manifesting in my life? Um, that will set you on a lifelong path. Uh, Dr. D'Angelo, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and being on The Tonight Show. I'd love to have you back. Okay, so that's seemingly the end of that. Let's quickly go through some of the comments. Um, and then I guess I'll read some of the book now. It's quite a short book. I, can't, I, I don't live alone. Uh, is that the systemic racism that I, I'm 24 years old. Get off my back, Robin. Maybe this will be in parts because I obviously can't go through the whole book in one video. So if you're curious about my hot take, uh, subscribe, uh, drop a comment that says so, uh, and like, if you like. <laughs> Let's go through some of these comments and then we'll get on to the actual book. I am black and don't know what the hell she's talking about. I believe it, Angela. This is what they're teaching at universities, keep in mind. True. Folks, this woman is a grifter. She's a corporate PR specialist. She charges 40K for speaking fees. 40K. Um, I don't think she charges 40K per session, though I do know that she does do quite a few speaking events per month and they most certainly pay a few grand each time so this is obviously going to be very lucrative for her like it really is the gift that keeps on giving because if you buy into this kind of thing this kind of circular reasoning um you can't say you're not racist you are racist the only way you can uh improve yourself is to uh, relinquish your whiteness uh, and things of that nature she can sell that forever. It's kind of like, I don't know, no matter how many times you go to church, you'll always be in sin, that kind of thing. So she's openly admitting she is racist, seriously. Yeah, this is like the thing. This is seemingly like part of the new woke thing. It's, it's more woke to say that you are racist than it is to say that you're not racist. And like, I've spent enough time in this uh, water to understand that it's like, well, because we racist systems. And so it, even if you admit that you benefit from these things, that's your making progress. And yeah, I don't know. Okay, so we have the circular reasoning thing of like, you can't not be racist. You are always racist. And obviously as the title of the book suggests, if people call you out on, 
what they perceive to be as racism and you say no i'm not racist that means that you're even more racist like a lot of the terminology that comes out of pockets such as these again i could go to my very working class black family and be like what does the acronym bipoc mean and why is that important and none of them will have a fucking clue i feel like if you want to talk about privilege there is probably nothing more exemplary of how much privileged of, of perhaps how much privilege such a person has as to whether they're informed on debates such as these. Let's read her f***ing book, shall we? Author's note, identity politics. The term identity politics refers to the focus of the barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. We have yet to achieve a founding principle, but any gains we have made thus far have come through identity politics. Identities on monolithic they're not all the same so the idea that they kind of have coordinating politics they have politics that coordinate with their identities and that's how things uh, kind of like battle through like is not true the identities of those sitting at the tables of power in this country have remained remarkably similar white male middle and upper class able-bodied acknowledging this fact may be dismissed as political correctness, but it is still a fact. Well, the highest earners in America are actually Asian men. I mean, I suppose it depends, like it, it depends on what you constitute as being as at the top of a country, which I'm almost sure is where the like goalposts will shift. And it's like, well, just because they're the highest earners doesn't mean X, Y, and Z. And it's like, I mean, true, but also if there's any political factor that I think has the most influence over social dynamics, I think it's more of an economic one. Personally, this book is unapologetically rooted in identity politics. I am white and am addressing a common white dynamic. I am mainly writing to a white audience. A white- Robin? Don't exclude me, Robin. Why are you writing to a predominantly white audience, Robin? What about me? Inequality can occur simply through homogeneity. If I am not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them true nor will i be motivated to remove the barriers if they provide an advantage to which i feel entitled that's not true people aren't all solipsistic believing that they're the only ones that matter and speaking as a white person to a primarily white audience i am yet again centering white people and the white voice no kidding i have not found a way around this dilemma for as an insider <laughs> It sounds like f***ing Russian espionage. I'm an insider to the whites. What are we talking about? That's kind of funny. Um, to not use my position this way to uphold racism and that I would never suggest that mine is only voice that should be heard, only that it is one of many pieces needed to solve the overall puzzle. This sounds like some Yu-Gi-Oh shit. It's trying to put together the Millennium Puzzle. That's a reference that's probably um, wasted on most of you, but I enjoyed it. People who do not identify as white may also feel this book helpful for understanding why it is so often difficult to talk to white people about racism. In my experience, whenever I've spoken to white people about racism, they're usually the very woke kind and seemingly have views that they believe supersede my views because they're the ones with the third eyes open. Because in my position, their views are much more identitarian. So what a fun little reverse roo that is. What about the multiracial people? Oh my god, I feel so seen, Robin. That's me. Oh my god, that's me, to be honest. That's literally me, to be honest. Okay, I f***ing hate myself. Throughout this book, I argue that racism is deeply complex and nuanced. And given this, we can never consider our learning to be complete or finished. That sounds a bit cultish, no cap. And though I believe, for reasons explained in chapter one, this temporarily suspending individuality to focus on group identity is healthy for white people, doing so has very different impacts on people of colour. For multiracial people in particular, these binary categories leave them in a frustrating middle. I'm gonna be honest, bro, for me it's really not that important. I'm not in a frustrating middle, or maybe me saying that I'm not is just more evidence that I am. What is this Kafka trap, bro? Can I not get out of this? Leave me alone. Stop speaking on my behalf, Robin. I would so appreciate, and 
be less critical of this if she literally just used the word some. It's like some multiracial people, some people of color. Like, not everybody thinks this way. <laughs> For example, though a child may look black and be raised as black, she may be raised primarily by a white parent and thus identify more strongly as white. What the f does that even mean? You can't identify as white. I know what that means in the context of this book, like all oh, the behaviors of white people, the beliefs of white people, etc. But again, groups aren't monoliths. You can't categorically say, this is what white is, this is what black is, and, and, and therefore like what their corresponding beliefs are. You know, like, the dynamics of what is termed passing, being perceived as white, will always shape a multiracial person's identity. I'm black passing. As passing will grant him or her society's rewards of what him or her, wow, is Robin D'Angelo gender normative confirmed? It is worth noting that though the term passing refers to the ability to blend in as a white person, there are no corresponding term for the ability to pass as a person of colour. I'm black passing. Yeah, because person of colour is a fucking category. Like what? Oh, are you white or are you a person of colour? Because it's like, well, you have blue, and even though blue is somewhat finite, there is variation in it. That's kind of like, that's what white is. But then people of colour, that's everything else. So it's like, how can you identify as an everything else? It's like, like you can't. You can either identify as blue or you can identify as every colour that's not blue. <sighs> I will not be able to do justice to the complexity of multiracial identity, this is true, but for the purposes of grappling with white fragility, I offer multiracial people the concept of saliency. That just means being seen. We all occupy multiple and intersecting social positionalities. I am white, but I am also a cisgender woman, able-bodied, and middle-aged. This bitch 60-something, but she ain't middle-aged, bro. My hope is that you may gain insight into why people who identify as white are so difficult in conversations regarding race and or gain insight into your own racial responses as you navigate the roiling racial waters of daily life. Well, that was, what is this called? The foreword? It's the book. It's the bit of the book before the book. And then we're in. We're in there like swimwear. But I'm genuinely looking forward to this. Uh, I suppose as a, as, a, as a series, vaguely. The plan is to follow this video up with my reading of this. I'll read it and then I'll relay to you as a person of color. And then I'll note back, I'll come with summaries. I'm coming with a varying perspectives. I would like it if you're interested, for you to come along for the journey. Because I think we'll have a fun time, of course, so you don't miss this coming up in the future. Uh, subscribe and also hit the bell. Thanks for joining me. I hope you continue joining me. Follow me on Twitter, bro. I'll just be tweeting jokes. Um, thanks for spending some time with me. I had fun spending time with you. Parasocial relationship game, bitch. Date